traditionally you run to the bond market. Traditionally you get, you know, risk-free interest rate, five and a half percent. Why would you ever own gold? Why would you ever own Bitcoin? Unless there's a crisis in that market, unless those things are down 60, 70%. But how can the U.S. use Bitcoin? Yeah, lean into democracy, technology, innovation, equality, right? In Bitcoin, everyone's treated equally, fair rights, no matter who you are, no matter your height, skin color, eye color, doesn't matter. Uh, and so you lean into that narrative and you start saying, we're going to innovate our way through this problem and, and try and instill confidence. So that's why I think it makes sense El Salvador adopt it. And it kind of makes sense that the U.S. is going after it. And it makes a lot of sense why Ghana wouldn't really give a shit right now. Bitcoin and Ethereum are navigating a challenging phase as they adapt to shifting market conditions, reflecting the broader market's ongoing recovery process. The VIX, often dubbed the market's fear gauge, has surged to its highest level in years, indicating increased anxiety across financial markets. This heightened volatility is drawing concern from investors and market analysts, who are now calling on the Federal Reserve to consider emergency rate cuts to support stabilization efforts. In a recent interview with podcaster Brandon, Jack Mallers, the founder of Strike, shared intriguing insights into Bitcoin's role amidst the current market recovery. Mullers discussed the significant shifts triggered by the national debt crisis and their implications for Bitcoin's price and adoption, shedding light on potential future trends. He argues that these economic upheavals could accelerate Bitcoin's mainstream acceptance and highlight its role as a hedge against systemic financial risks. During the pandemic, unchecked money printing caused rampant inflation and a bond market crisis unseen since the 1800s. Investors are turning to Bitcoin and gold as safe havens. Mullers views Bitcoin as a revolutionary force, citing El Salvador's unique position to benefit and signaling Bitcoin's inevitable mainstream adoption. Watch clips from the interview for further insights into Jack Mallers' conversation with Brandon. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more content. Enjoy the video. My thesis as for this cycle in Bitcoin, and I've made some bold price predictions, is highly predicated on uh, the sovereign debt crisis. So it's the debt crisis, it's the demand for United States government debt, which also is known as the bond market. And so what has happened is you had record money printing through COVID. So COVID, I think, was close to 40% percent of the US dollars that exist today were printed in the last four years. So excessive money printing, which leads to inflation. That's going to inflate the prices of goods and services. There's more currency issued than there are scrambled eggs, than there are Caesar salads, especially than there are Bitcoins, especially than there are Miami real estate, right? Then the way to stop that is to tighten monetary policy, which is effectively deleting dollars from the market so that if you reduce the quantity of dollars, you're bringing the prices back down. The way to achieve that is to increase the cost of capital is the, is the is the interest rate. So they raised rates as fast as possible. Um, all of that volatility in, in <laughs> manipulating the value of money, which is really effectively um, our time and energy in an abstracted form, um, causes a lot of stress on the market, one of which has been the sovereign debt market, has been the bond market. So for the first time since the mid-1800s, um, we're in a very severe a bond bear market. And so in my opinion, all of this unravels from that core idea is that we've never been in a worse bear market for bonds, government bonds, unless you go back to 1860. Traditionally, you run to the bond market. Traditionally, you get you know risk-free interest rate, 5.5%. Why would you ever own gold? Why would you ever own Bitcoin? Unless there's a crisis in that market, unless those things are down 60, 70%. Then you got to go somewhere else. So what investors figured out is, hold on a second, Japan, they have zero interest rates. They still have no cost of capital. I can actually go borrow money in Japan instead of the United States of America, take the yen, swap it for dollars, and then use the dollars to buy the assets and hide in the assets. And so when you see gold making new highs despite high interest rates, when you see Bitcoin making new highs, despite high interest rates, when you say, see real estate market not crashing, you're seeing NVIDIA and the S&P 500 still ripping. You know, their times are still inflationary despite high rates. So there was still a lot of buy pressure, buy side on assets. The reason I've committed my life to Bitcoin and so many others have is because it has that, you know, level of change. Um, I, I think it can change the world in such an astronomical way. 
Um, and the adoption of it is just so natural. You know, at the baseline, no matter who you are, you're better off on Bitcoin's team than against it, period. Doesn't matter who you are. And so very naturally, everyone finds themselves on Bitcoin's team. And so uh, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, when someone said, aren't you shocked that guy likes Bitcoin? No, because people aren't stupid. Um, it's in their best interest to like Bitcoin. Um, so I love the safe quote, you know, Bitcoin will be adopted like gunpowder. Um, for those that don't adopt it, you'll become its victim. Like as a Bitcoiner, I think you got to rip the bandaid, you got to print and you got to just say, you know what? We f***ed up. Let's enter a new era. But do I think that's going to happen? No. Do I think that, you know, my buddies in high school that don't own any Bitcoin would love that? No, I don't. Um, I think they'd be overnight destroyed. So I, I would price that reality as not very high, in my opinion. On the El Salvador stuff, you know, the one thing that's interesting about El Salvador is they don't have their own currency. So they went through a brutal civil war. People, I think everyone knows who El Salvador is now, but maybe not some of the history that's gotten them to the point of adopting Bitcoin. They went through a really bad civil war and lost their own currency. So they were on the dollar. That gives them some type of advantage in adopting something like Bitcoin because they're not foregoing their own money printer. Jack Mallers warns that Bitcoin is the ultimate safeguard against impending currency devaluation and financial turmoil. He argues that amid market instability, Bitcoin stands out as a resilient investment, potentially flourishing even when other assets falter. Mahler's believes a billion dollar investment in Bitcoin could significantly boost purchasing power and deliver exceptional value. He emphasizes that Bitcoin aligns with his philosophy of creating more value than consumed, a principle that guides strikes operations. As the financial landscape grows increasingly uncertain, Mahler's highlights strikes strategic focus on Bitcoin, prudent hiring, and commitment to customer satisfaction, positioning it as a standout player in a crisis-ridden market. Let's go back to the interview and watch more clips to gain insights from Jack Mallers. Bitcoin is the best expression of currency debasement. If you want to capture currency debasement, if you want to put option on the existing system, if you want to be long volatility, long chaos, if you want to monetize madness, the perfect thing to do is, is own Bitcoin. And so... That's what I think, no matter what. I don't care if Sailor buys another one or not. I think the thing's going to the moon. Uh, but I think Sailor's a genius. And I think that this strategy is just pure logic. What am I doing? I'm, I'm <laughs> taking out debt in a thing that only goes down. And I'm hoarding and buying a thing that only goes up. We are a profitable business. We stack every day. So a lot of our revenue is in Bitcoin, and then uh, we stack our cash flows every month. I mean, the way I run Strike is we treat it like two business lines internally. We have our operating company, which we, you know people buy and sell Bitcoin with us. People do all sorts of Bitcoin stuff with us. We charge fees. We monetize it. We make more than we consume from, from the world. So I think of being profitable as almost like a moral obligation before a financial one. It's you're doing more for the world than you're taking from the world, right? And that's technically making the world a better place is if you're producing more goods and services that people value than you're taking from, right? And so that's been important to us. I think that also gives our customers trust in us and allows them to value like, we're not going anywhere. We're here for the long haul. We're a business that's sustainable and that's here to last. We're not reliant on venture or whatever. If you gave me a billion dollars, I probably wouldn't hire a f***ing soul, but I'd put it to work tomorrow. What would I do? I'd buy a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. So, you know, if, if the capital is actually worth something, it's backed by time and energy, um, and it can actually increase purchasing power and work for you, and you can store it, put it under your mattress, and it's worth more tomorrow than it was yesterday, it changes everything. So we only hire as necessary. Um we only focus on making our customers happy. Customers are the most important thing to us. We care deeply about Bitcoiners. That's actually one of the things I think differentiates us is that we are Bitcoiners. You know, a lot of people that serve Bitcoin products don't necessarily like Bitcoiners. Like, I don't think Coinbase, you know, likes Bitcoin Core, likes Bitcoiners, likes the Lightning Network, right? So, um, I don't know. Customer focus, low time preference. Um, we just do logical things that make sense. And we can afford to because of Bitcoin. If I had to build this business without Bitcoin and it was about growth, 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 it'd be a much more interesting question. It'd be like, well, shit, I don't know. We're going to try and invent 
you know, the Bitcoin uh, infinity uh, machine or whatever. I, you know, you'd have to come up with wild, crazy shit. The inside scoop on strike, man, is this, uh, you know, when I founded it, uh, I was very early to lightning. I thought lightning was underinvested and underappreciated. Still do. Our lightning products still grow very organically. But what happened is the market fell apart. Um, that 2022 bear market through a lot of 2023 FTX went under. And, you know, when I got into Bitcoin 11 years ago, I thought Mt. Gox was going to be the Bitcoin company for the world or one of which the best Bitcoin wallet services, the best Bitcoin on and off ramps, the leading in Bitcoin technology that have the newest features, the newest developments, the best customer service. Well, turns out that didn't happen, right? But then sure enough, Coinbase and Brian Armstrong would do it. Someone came along, got Mark Andreessen involved, A16Z, Silicon Valley funded San Francisco, but they didn't seem to want that either, right? They're much more interested in Ethereum and crypto. And I was like, okay, but then Sam Bankman Freed and Binance and CZ, I mean, those guys got more money than God and they seem to be way smarter than everyone else, but now they're both in jail. And so I think what we realized at Strike is we looked around, we're like, hold on a second, because we were getting so much demand from Bitcoiners of like, you know, we love lightning and the vision and stuff, but like, how about giving us buy sell? How about giving us good on chain wallet? How about giving us a private client service? How about giving us killer customer support? And we kind of looked internally and we were like, wait, we are the most regulated Bitcoin company in the world right now. We've got some of the best technology in the world right now. You know, are we the most principled, ethical, technologically talented, product oriented, customer focused Bitcoin company on planet Earth? And the answer was yeah. <laughs> Everyone else was either focused on shit coins or in jail. Recent data shows a dramatic $89.73 million withdrawal from Bitcoin ETFs in just one day, reflecting deep investor skepticism. With Bitcoin ETF net inflows plummeting and major funds like Bitwise's BITB and Fidelity's FBTC suffering severe losses, the volatility in Bitcoin's market is palpable. Grayscale's GBTC is hit the hardest raising alarms about Bitcoin stability. Jack Maller suggests that Bitcoin's unique qualities make it the best bet against ongoing instability. He argues that with Bitcoin's potential to appreciate and safeguard purchasing power, it's a moral and financial imperative to embrace it. He even claims that Strike would invest a billion dollars into Bitcoin if given the chance, reinforcing his belief in its transformative potential. The market's erratic behavior and the ongoing Bitcoin ETF withdrawals signal a crucial juncture for investors. Jack Maller suggests that Bitcoin's inherent qualities make it the most reliable safeguard against ongoing financial instability. As market volatility continues, the erratic behavior and recent Bitcoin ETF withdrawals indicate a critical turning point for investors. These developments highlight growing uncertainty and underscore the need for strategic adjustments in investment approaches. The heightened instability in traditional and crypto markets alike amplifies the importance of Bitcoin as a potential haven amidst financial turbulence. Mahler's insights reflect broader concerns about market dynamics and the strategic value of digital assets in navigating the current economic landscape. Will Bitcoin prove to be a beacon of stability or succumb to the current financial turmoil? Share your thoughts and join the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more updates on this unfolding financial crisis.